Now, the subject of today's class is the four noble truths. <coughs> the teaching of the four noble truths is uh, very important among the teachings of the Buddha. Actually, whatever the Buddha taught during 40 years of his ministry can be reduced to the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. And so it is an important subject. <coughs> Before we go into the Four Noble Truths first, we must understand what truth means according to uh, teachings of the Buddha. <clears throat> now, what is truth? It's very simple. Something that is true. So, something that is real. Something that is that is uh, not otherwise than say it is stated. So, truth is mm, not like illusion in magic shows because in magic shows illusions are untrue and also it is not deceptive like a mirage so you see a mirage from a distance and then you think there is water there but when you uh, get close to it it mm, how to call it uh, disappears or it runs away from you so, truth is not like a mirage, uh, which is deceptive. And also, truth is something that can be that can be discovered, uh, that can be discovered, uh, that can be known. <coughs> and that is what is called truth in Buddhism. So, actually, anything which is true, which is real is called truth in Buddhism. And so truth need not be lofty, truth need not be uh, only good, but whatever it is, if it is uh, true to what, what it has been described, then it is a truth. Now, uh, hotness or heat in fire. So heat in fire is a truth because it is always true uh, or whatever uh, thing it comes into contact with, it will heat it up or it will burn it. And so that heat in the fire is a truth. And as you may know, that the second noble truth is craving. Craving is an unwholesome mental state, but it is also uh, called truth uh, in Buddhism. So in Buddhism, uh, truth need not be uh, good only, truth need not be wholesome only. It can be both uh, good and bad, wholesome and unwholesome. And people say that there is only one truth, and different teachers express uh, it in different ways. But in Buddhism, there is not one truth. There are four truths, and these four truths are called noble truths. <coughs> now, they are called noble truths because uh, they are to be, to be realized by, they are to be penetrated by the noble ones. Now, in, in Buddhism, those who have attained enlightenment are called noble ones. So, those are the Buddhas, and then Pachika Buddhas, Arahants, and also uh, the, uh, those that have reached uh, the lower stages of enlightenment. So, these uh, persons are called noble ones and the 
four truths taught by the Buddha are called noble truths because they are <coughs> uh, to be penetrated by or they are to be understood by, they are to be realized by the noble ones. Now actually when they become noble ones they have already penetrated these four noble truths. But here uh, we, we, we use the term noble mm, to mean those who are trying to become nobles. So uh, these truths are called noble truths because they are to be penetrated by <coughs> the noble ones. The second meaning of uh, the name noble truth is that it is the truth of the Noble One. Here, the Noble One means the Buddha. So, these are the truths of the Buddha. That means, these are the truths mm, discovered and made known by the Buddha. And <coughs> who uh, penetrate these truths do so uh, depending or relying on the Buddha. So that is why uh, in this sense the, the noble truths are called noble truths because they are the truths of the Buddha, the truths possessed by the Buddha or the truths discovered by and taught by the Buddha. Now, the third meaning is <coughs> these are called noble truths because they are noble making. That means when a person penetrates them he becomes a noble. So these truths make someone uh, that penetrates them noble persons. That is why uh, these truths are called noble truths. So in this sense, they are no called noble truths because they make uh, someone noble. Or when someone penetrates them, he become, he or she becomes a noble person. <coughs> so what are these noble truth. Now there are four of them. Uh, first, I want you to be familiar with the names of these four noble truths in Pali um, or both in Pali and English. Now the first noble truth is called Dukkha, right? And truth means Satya. So Dukkha, Satya. Or let's say just Dukkha. And the second noble truth is Samudaya. Samudaya. And then the third noble truth is Nirodha. DHA. And then the fourth noble truth is, it's a long name, Dukkha Nirodha Kamini Patibara. <coughs> now, it is important to understand the meaning of these words first. <coughs> The first one is the word dukkha. Now dukkha is translated as suffering. As I have told you many times, uh, the English word suffering does not cover all the shades of meaning <coughs> possessed by the word dukkha in, in, in Pali. Now the word dukkha is explained in the commentaries as composed of du and ka. There are many, many meanings of do and many meanings of ka. But in Visodhimaga, uh, the meaning of do is given as despicable or vile and ka. Ka means empty. So something that is despicable and that is empty is called dukkha. Now why is it despicable? Because it is a cause of all 
all sub, uh, dangers and, uh, and suffering. And it is empty, that is, it is empty of everlasting entity. It is empty of beauty, it is empty of mm, uh, lastingness, it is empty of pleasure, so it is called dukkha. So, in this sense, dukkha means something which is despicable and at the same time which is empty. <coughs> the other meaning of dukkha given in other commentaries is hmm, that something which is difficult to endure or difficult to bear. Do means difficult and ka means endure or bear. So something which is difficult to bear is called dukkha. So this meaning uh, makes more sense for us. Because whenever we hear the word dukkha, we, uh, we always think of some kind of pain or suffering. But as you will know a few moments later, even what we call happiness is according to the analysis of the Buddha, dukkha. <coughs> so we will understand the word dukkha as see, something despicable and empty or something that, that is difficult to endure. Now the second truth is called samudhya or Dukkha Samudhya. Now, it is important to understand the meaning of the word Samudhya. Samudhya is composed of Sam, U, and Aya. Huh? S-A-M, U, and A-Y-A. Here, E-Y-E, Aya means a cause, and U means arising, and Sun means coming together, or combined with something. So, the, the whole word Samudhya means a cause of the arising, actually of Dukkha. The cause of arising of Dukkha, when combined with other conditions, well, that is important, when combined with other conditions. Mostly, we think that the cause of dukkha is what? Craving, right? But craving is not the only cause of suffering. There are other causes and conditions also. But craving is most prominent among them, and so we just say craving is the cause of or the origin of dukkha. Now, craving does not arise alone. It always arises with its companion. What is that? Ignorance. And also there are other, other conditions. So, when craving uh, get the companionship of, of uh, ignorance and others, it can cause dukkha. So, samudhya, the, word, the, the, the meaning of the word samudhya should be understood that way. A cause of the arising of dukkha when combined with other conditions. Noble truth is the Noble truth of cessation of suffering, and in Pali it is called Dukkha Nirodha, or just Nirodha. <coughs> Here, the word Nirodha is divided into Ni and Rodha, R O D H A. And the, the prefix Ni means no or absence, and Rodha means a prison or a confinement. So here a prison means the prison of round of rebirths. 
So the the third noble truth is called nirodha, because there is the absence of or suggestion of the prison of samsara, the prison of um, round of rebirths. So this is one one meaning of the word nirodha. Second meaning given in the commentaries is. Mm, Nirodha means the truth on attainment of which there is absence of the prison of samsara. That means when a person attains the third noble truth, uh, which is Nibbana, there is no more rebirth for him. So when a person attains Nibbana, there will be no samsara for him in the future. And so that the, the third noble truth, which is Nirvana, is called Nirodha. <coughs> One more meaning. And <coughs> here the commentaries explain that the word is taken uh, as ni- just Nirodha, and it means non arising in the future. Sometimes we, we translate it as cessation. But cessation really means uh, non arising in the future. Now, when a person uh, attains enlightenment and eradicates mental defilements, he renders these mental defilements um, to be non arising in the future. So the word niroda is made to mean non-arising in the future. And this third, third noble truth is called non-arising in the future because see, it, is the, it is the condition or it is the object of the um, enlightenment consciousness uh, which uh, brings about the non-arising mm, in the future of the third noble truth has a long name Dukkha Niroda Kamini Patibhada now Patibhada means practice and Dukkha is Dukkha and Niroda is cessation and Kamini now this is translated as this word is translated as the path leading to the cessation of suffering. But the commentary, the explanation of the commentary is a little different. It explains that it is the practice that goes to the cessation of suffering. And here, goes to means take cessation of suffering as an object. Now, uh, the fourth noble truth, as you as you may know, is the eightfold path, or the eight factors of path. And at the moment of enlightenment, a path consciousness arises, and these eight factors accompany that consciousness. Path consciousness takes nibbana as object, and so these eight factors also take nibbana as object. So taking nibbana as, as object is here said to uh, said to go to the object. So the the practice or the path that goes to uh, the cessation of suffering that goes to nibbana is called. Dukkha Niroda Kamini. So, uh, in, in, in reality, the, the fourth noble truth is uh, that which uh, realizes the third noble truth, which takes the third noble truth as object. So, it is not quite the path leading to the cessation of suffering, 
it takes position of suffering as object until it is already there actually. <coughs> so these are the <coughs> meanings given in the commentaries and I think understanding uh, in this way can help us to understand the Four Noble Truths um, better. But after understanding the, the what meanings uh, of these Four Noble Truths, uh, we will just call them by their popular names, uh, the, the Noble Truth of Suffering, Noble Truth of Origin of Suffering, Noble Truth of Cessation of Suffering, and Noble Truth of the Path that goes to the cessation of suffering. Now, these four Noble Truths are important, I said. First, it was the Buddha who discovered these four Noble Truths. Now, these four Noble Truths are not created by the Buddha. Actually, they were, say, hidden under a thick growth of ignorance when there uh, were no Buddhas in the world. And then a Buddha appears and discovers or penetrates these four noble truths. And the discovery or penetration of these four noble truths um, makes him a Buddha. And then after that the Buddha reveals these four noble truths to the world. So, the Four Noble Truths are not created by the Buddha, but were discovered and taught by the Buddha. And then, Buddha was not indebted to anyone for the discovery of these Four Noble Truths. That means, Buddha does not need anybody's help or anybody's teaching to discover these Four Noble Truths. He discovered and depenetrated these Four Noble Truths all by himself, depending on himself only. <coughs> <coughs> you may have read the first, uh, the Buddha's first sermon. And in, in that Sutta, the Buddha said, mm, in the Dhammas unheard of before. So, that means these Four Noble Truths were not known by beings before uh, the Buddha appears in the world. And the Buddha taught them in his very first Sama. Now you all know that two, two, exactly two months after his enlightenment, Buddha taught his first Sama to, uh, to his five disciples. And in the first Sama, Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths. So, we know that the, the Four Noble Truths are the important, uh, important part of the Buddha's teachings because he, he taught them first uh, in his first sermon to his five disciples. <coughs> and also, the Four Noble Truths are important because there can be no enlightenment without the realization of these four noble truths. Buddha once said, it is through not understanding, not penetrating the four noble truths, that I, as well as you, had to wander so long through the round of rebirth. So Buddha said, it is through not understanding and not penetrating the Four Noble Truths that say, he as well as <coughs> and the, his disciples had to go through this round of rebirth for a long, long time. So, uh, since it is impossible uh, to gain enlightenment without realizing, without without seeing by direct knowledge these four noble truths, these four noble truths are, uh, are very important. 
<coughs> and Buddha was very firm and sure about these four noble truths. Uh, he said, there are only these four noble truths and there are no more or no less. And also, uh, there is no one other than the Buddhas uh, who can teach these four noble truths. Uh, who can teach means who can discover uh, by themselves and teach and the four noble truths to all beings. So, <coughs> these four noble truths are mm, important both to understand and to realize. Now we come to the four noble truths. <coughs> we will follow the exposition given by the Buddha himself. You can find this exposition in the first sermon and also in the discourse on the four foundations of mindfulness. Now the Buddha said the first noble truth of um, the noble truth of dukkha, birth is suffering, decay is suffering, disease is suffering, death is suffering, Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are suffering. Association with beings and things that one dislikes is suffering. Dissociation from beings and things that one likes is suffering. Not to get what one desires is suffering. And in brief, the five aggregates of clinging are suffering. So this is the exposition given by the Buddha. Let us go through it one by one. Now, Buddha said, birth is suffering. Birth is suffering. Birth here means conception uh, for, for human beings, conception in the womb of the mother. <coughs> so birth is suffering because it is, uh, it is a base it is a basis for all uh, sufferings we encounter uh, in our lives. So since, since we, we have birth as a human being, say we suffer old age, disease, death, sorrow, lamentation, and so on. So, Buddha said, birth is suffering. Then decay or old age is suffering. We don't need much explanation about this. Getting, getting old, we do not like to get old. We, 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 we like to be young, or at least we like to look young. But however much we, 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 we don't want to get old, however much we want to uh, look uh, young, we are getting old day by day hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second. And so, decay or old age is one which we do not like, but we have to endure. <coughs> so, decay or old age is also suffering. And disease is suffering. To have any kind of disease is suffering. Death is suffering. So, we don't want to die. <coughs> we are afraid of death but we will have to face it one day and there is no escape from death and so this is also suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair, these are suffering. So we don't, we don't need much, much thought to understand this. And then association with beings and things that one desires, uh, that, does, that, one, uh, that one dislikes, is suffering. This is also not difficult to understand. If we have to live with someone we don't like, we suffer. Or if we have to have something we don't like, suppose you, you, you have a car you don't like and you have to be driving that car, so every time you drive that guy you are not in a good mood, uh, you are suffering. So it's, it's plain, it's easy to understand. And then dissociation from beings and things that one likes. If you are separated from your loved ones, you suffer. If you are separated from something you you, uh, you like, you cherish, uh, say your new car, maybe your house or whatever, then you suffer. 
and then not to get am I going too wrong? <laughs> not to get one what one desires. No, not to get what one desires is suffering. You want to get something and you don't get it and you suffer, right? No, that is a superficial understanding of it. A deeper understanding of it is here uh, not to get what uh, we desire means we don't want to get old. We don't want to get disease. We don't want to get old age, free, freedom from disease, freedom from death. And so that is suffering. That is tormenting us. We don't like it, but we have to suffer. So, with these uh, words or explanations, Buddha taught us the first noble truth, the noble truth of suffering, which we can understand easily. Nobody will uh, what do you call? Nobody will mm, deny that these are suffering. But there is another aspect of suffering that the first noble truth, which Buddha stated at the end of the exposition of the first noble truth, and that is, in brief, the five aggregates are suffering. Now, we, we have no difficulty in accepting uh, birth as suffering, decay as suffering, and so on. But, with regard to the last statement, that is, in brief, the five aggregates of clinging are suffering, we may have some difficulty. Don't we sometimes enjoy ourselves Sometimes we are happy, or uh, as young men you may enjoy some sensual places and so on. And is that sukha? Is that happiness? Or uh, isn't that happiness? <coughs> but according to the Buddha, they are also dukkha, right? Now the five aggregates of clinging. I hope, I hope you are all familiar with the five aggregates. Now, uh, Buddha said that most beings are composed of five, five groups, five, they are called five aggregates. Uh, aggregate of matter, aggregate of feeling, of perception, of mental formations, and of consciousness. Or we can say, say we have the body, feeling, perception, uh, other mental states and consciousness. And these five aggregates, almost, almost all of these five aggregates are the object of clinging, object of attachment. So, by this last sentence, the in brief, the five aggregates of clinging are suffering, Buddha means to say everything in the world, everything in the world of sentient beings is suffering. So what we think, what we consider to be happiness is in the analysis uh, of Buddha suffering. Why? Because Buddha said whatever is impermanent is dukkha. So anything that is impermanent must be dukkha. Whether we, we translate it as suffering or not, everything that is impermanent is dukkha. Our bodies, are they permanent or impermanent? They, they, our bodies will not last forever, right? our thoughts, our mental states, also, they just come and go. So what we, what we take to be happiness also just come and go. Uh, say you, you enjoy life, you enjoy, uh, say, essential pleasures, but they just also you know, do not last long. They just come and go. So since they are impermanent, because they have a beginning and an end, they are said to be uh, dukkha. So in this sense, Everything in this ancient world is dukkha. 
That is why uh, we should understand Dukkha uh, with reference to the meaning given by the commentary. That Dukkha means something that is despicable and empty. Now, despicable means because it is the haunt of or because it is the home of many dangers. And it is empty because there is no permanent entity or no soul or no self. So, uh, we should understand the first noble truth on both these two levels, the ordinary level and the deeper philosophical level. So, only when we understand in these two ways can we say that we understand the, the, the first noble truth. Only when we understand in this way can we accept that Dukkha is everywhere. But it is not to make you depressed. And many people say that uh, they don't like Buddhism because Buddhism talked about and Dukkha very much. <coughs> but it is like a physician telling a patient that he has a disease. A physician examines a, a patient and he finds a, a disease in that man and then he, a physician must say, you have such a disease. So we cannot accuse a physician of um, being pessimist or uh, uh, having desire to depress his patients because it is a fact and he must declare this fact to the patient. So in the same way, uh, we are like patients and Buddha diagnoses us and then he found that we are suffering from this Dukkha disease. So Buddha said, you have this Dukkha disease. So it, it is just stating the fact, not to not to make us uh, sorry, not to make us depressed. And if we understand the, the last explanation of the Buddha that the, the, the five aggregates of clinging are suffering, then we can understand that and we can accept that the world is really Dukkha. So according to the last statement in the exposition of the first noble truth, uh, we should understand that life itself is suffering, or life is equated with suffering. So when we say suffering, we mean life, and when we say life, we mean suffering. Now, next Buddha pointed out the cause or the origin of suffering or dukkha. And Buddha said, it is craving. So here craving means craving or attachment, greed, uh, lust, uh, everything, uh, every mental state uh, that has connection uh, with desire or want. <coughs> so Buddha said the craving is the origin of suffering, the origin of dukkha. And he explains that this craving gives rise to fresh rebirth. Now rebirth is life, right? Rebirth is the beginning of life and so rebirth is life. So this rebirth life is dukkha. And here Buddha said craving gives rise to fresh rebirth. So it is same as saying uh, craving uh, give rise to or brings about dukkha. And also he said, this craving is bound up with pleasure and lust. Actually, pleasure and lust are themselves craving. So craving, lust, pleasure, attachment, greed, they mean the same thing. And also Buddha said, it finds ever fresh delight here and there. So here and there means in this life and in that life, uh, in, in, in lives. Now it is said that the first active thought moment 
in one life is accompanied by attachment to that life. So wherever a being is reborn, even if uh, he is reborn in hell, the first active moment in that life is always bound up with attachment. So it takes the light in this, here and there. <coughs> and there are three kinds of craving mentioned in the first summer and also mentioned in other places. So the origin of dukkha is craving. Now here, when it's uh, Buddha said, craving gives rise to fresh rebirth and so on, that means the present rebirth is the result of the past craving. And then present craving will be the cause of the future rebirth. So in, in that way we should understand the second noble truth. Now another way of understanding it is to consider situations in, in this life. And we can, we can see that craving causes suffering. We often heard a, a news about a plane crash and many people were killed in the crash. So when we heard the news, how much dukkha do we suffer? Maybe just a little bit. Or we may say, oh poor people, something like that. So we don't, we don't, we don't feel uh, so deeply. But if um, there was a friend of us among those who perished, our suffering is greater. We, we, we suffer more. What if a relative of ours um, was in that crash or a very dear person was in that crash, we would suffer a lot. So our suffering actually it's not caused by the death of a person, but the attachment we put on that person. The more attachment we have for that person, the more dukkha we suffer. So the real culprit here is the attachment or craving for that person and not, not the death of or the loss of that person. So. And the same way things say we put much value on. Sometimes the price of the thing may be not great, but we put some sentimental value on it and so we, we cherish it. But if that thing is taken away from us, if that thing uh, is stolen away or say uh, gets broken, we suffer a lot because we have put so much uh, attachment a sentimental value on that, on that thing. So uh, our, mm, our suffering actually is not caused by uh, the loss of that, that thing, but actually by the, by the degree of attachment we put on that thing. So if we, if we consider that way, we can understand that uh, attachment causes suffering. But Buddha's explanation goes deeper than that, actually. Buddha's explanation here is craving gives rise to fresh rebirth. Now, we are all attached to our lives. We don't want to die. We will hold on to our lives until the last moment. <coughs> so, uh, so strong is that attachment to life that it has, it has a potential, say, it has the, the energy say, to, to create another life. So even though we die here, the attachment we have uh, creates or, or brings about or gives rise to another 
another birth in the future. So the future rebirth is actually the cause, I mean, uh, the result of the attachment we have in this life. So that actually uh, Buddhas and those who who have the supernormal power of uh, remembering past lives and also supernormal power of seeing beings uh, dying from one existence and being reborn another. So such persons alone can uh, see uh, this clearly. But we also believe uh, that craving give rise to fresh rebirth because the Buddha taught it and also uh, we, can, we can infer from craving uh, causing uh, suffering in this life. So if, 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 if it can co- uh, cause suffering in this life, it can also uh, cause suffering in future lives because it has the power, it has the potential to create uh, a life in the future. <coughs> and Buddha said, there are three kinds of craving. Now, I want you to be familiar with the Pali names of these three kinds of craving. The first is Kama Tanha, K-E-M-A, T-H-A-N-A. The second is Bhava Tanha, B-H-A-V-A. And the third is Vi Bhava Tanha. V I B H A V A and then Tanna. <coughs> I want you to be familiar with the Pali words because there is so much misunderstanding about these three. <coughs> the first one, Kama Tanha, means craving for desirable objects. Now there are sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touch, and thinking, thoughts, which are desirable. And desire for these desirable objects, attachment to these desirable objects, is called kama tanha. So it is craving for desirable objects. <coughs> the second one is called bhava tanha. Now the word bhava means existence, becoming. Here, according to the commentaries, here it means not just existence or becoming, but it is a wrong view that um, beings are permanent. Or uh, there is a soul and that soul is permanent. So, the, the Bhava here means uh, what is called the eternity view, uh, taking um, things to be eternal, taking, taking things to be permanent. It is one, one of the wrong views. <coughs> now, <coughs> craving associated with this kind of wrong view is called bhavatana. So bhavatana does not mean craving for existence. Craving for existence can be included in the first one, kamatana. <coughs> because existence is also uh, the desirable object. So. Bhavatana here means craving which is accompanied by or which is associated with the eternity view. Say you, you, you may have a view that things are permanent, things are eternal, and the craving uh, that is accompanied by that view, that arises together with that view, is called uh, Bhavatana. So it is not craving for existence. 
craving associated with eternity view. And the third one, vibhavatana. Now there is another view which states that beings, beings die and then there is no more of them in the future. <coughs> it is called annihilation view. So a being is annihilated at death and there is no more of him in the future. Craving associated with or accompanied by that kind of wrong view is called vibhavatana. Sometimes beings may have eternity view or some others may have uh, annihilation view and a craving accompanying that view uh, is called uh, bhavatana or vibhavatana. So vibhavatana is, is craving associated with annihilation view. Now, some translate it as craving for self-annihilation and it, it's very misleading. Once I gave a book to a, a man and next week he, he, he said, uh, Buddhism um, accepts suicide <laughs> because we are craving for self-annihilation as mentioned, in the, uh, mentioned by the Buddha in this Sutta. <laughs> so it is, we don't want to is not craving for annihilation, but craving associated with this kind of wrong view. <coughs> so these are three uh, crave, three kinds of craving described by, by, the, by the Buddha in his exposition of the second noble truth. Now a clever physician will not just stop at finding the disease. He will also find out what causes that disease. In the same way, the Buddha <coughs> first discovered that say, the world of sentient beings has this disease of suffering. And he does not stop there. He also discovers the origin of that suffering or what causes that suffering. Now, after knowing the disease and the cause of the disease, the next question would be what? Can that disease be cured? In the same way, after understanding that there is Dukkha, and that is the origin of Dukkha, we want to know whether there is absence of Dukkha, whether this, uh, this disease of Dukkha can be cured. Okay, I'm going to leave you today with the disease and the cause of disease. <laughs> You'll have to wait one month. <laughs> to get the answer whether it can be cured. Okay.